our next speaker is James Colander from the University of British Columbia. He's also the director of PIMS, uh, Pacific Institute of Mathematical Sciences, and is the uh, UMI in Vancouver. And he's going to talk about Hamiltonian partial differential equation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's a tremendous honor to be here. This is a very historical moment. Um, PIMS has been a Unité Mixte Internationale for 10 years and it has been an incredible collaboration with CNRS. It's allowed the 10 universities that PIMS serves to develop very rich collaborations with our colleagues from France and I congratulate you all here for uh, forging this fantastic partnership and I wish you all great success with the launch of La Soul. Um, I'm also very grateful to have the opportunity to address you here today. Um, building on what others have said, I wish to give you a kind of overview of a field. Um, along the way, I'll highlight some things that are either my opinion or things that I've made a contribution on. Um, but I also recognize that we are in the presence of many very strong mathematicians, but not necessarily people who are experts in this very narrow subject. So I aspire to give a somewhat general um, talk. And please feel free to interrupt. So let me start by asking you all to imagine a very large paraboloid. And now I'd like you to imagine a single point attached to that paraboloid. And I'd like to give you three different dynamical descriptions of the way that point might move on that paraboloid. The first way is perhaps the most trivial and obvious way that this point could move, which is that it sits down at the bottom and does not move at all. The second way is that this point executes some sort of a spiral and eventually gets down to the bottom of the well and it sits there. And the third way that I'd like you to imagine is that this point executes motion along a level set and it stays inside of a circle as it goes all the way around. Of these three different types of motions, the one that I like the best, the one that reminds me of my heartbeat that I hope will continue forever, is the one that goes round and round and round. And this is representative of Hamiltonian dynamics. The spiral that goes down is representative of parabolic dynamics and the lack of dynamics, if you will, is more typical of elliptic partial differential equations. But now let's imagine that this paraboloid that we've imagined is built over a large finite dimensional set. We can still begin to imagine these types of dynamics and if we had more and more and more dimensions, we might involve some sort of a Hilbert space and a hyperboloid or a paraboloid above this Hilbert space and we may want to understand the dynamics in this infinite dimensional space. So that's a function space perspective that guides the creation of one way to think about this subject of Hamiltonian partial differential equations. Let me give you a second perspective. So if you derive partial differential equations from sort of continuum mechanics style models and you do things like Taylor's expansions and small parameters and expansions, you encounter certain partial differential equations. And in many cases, these uh, arguments that you make to derive these types of equations are canonical. And by that I mean, if you're thinking about problems involving ocean waves and you perform these types of maneuvers, you land on a certain equation. And if you're thinking about problems in plasma physics and you perform these types of uh, uh, manipulations, you land on the same equations. So it turns out that sort of at the bottom of the well of many of these applied math style calculations, certain canonical equations that have ubiquitous relevance in many different fields of application emerge. So from that point of view, many of these Hamiltonian partial differential equations can be motivated from the perspective of physics. Let me give you a third motivation for studying this subject. There are some remarkably surprising, beautiful equations such as the Korteweg de Vries equation, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation in one dimension, which have turned out to have magical algebraic properties and they form completely integrable systems with which people have developed interesting techniques to understand these equations in a, in a nice way. So one might think of these special equations with these magical properties as a discrete set within a large family of problems which may emerge from physics. So the things that we understand from these algebraic techniques are interesting, but what about a small perturbation of one of these algebraically rigid objects? 
Do we still understand the phenomena? And in some sense, the analogy here might be something like a completely integrable system. When you perturb it, you move in the direction of kolmogorov arnold moser theorem, and so forth. So what are the analytic structures that allow us to understand completely integrable models within a family of other models? So I've tried to describe a few motivations, but let me give you one fourth. There are also connections with statistical physics that allow one to view these types of dynamical systems that I'm going to describe as connected with questions around recurrence. So in some sense, that's a connection to the previous talk. And there are also uh, other ways that these equations can be viewed as connected to, say, quantum field theory. There are many reasons to study these equations. So what I've tried to set up is a perspective that I hope connects to many different branches of mathematics that engages you and once uh, and hopefully inspires you to pay attention to some of the things that I'll tell you about next. <laughs> so a quick overview is I'm going to now coalesce this large subject of many, many different examples of Hamiltonian partial differential equations and I'm going to pick one, I think of one somewhat representative collection of problems and I'm going to look at a family of nonlinear Schrodinger equations. I'm going to highlight the fact that these equations have some conservation properties, which give you some very nice gross uh, insights into what the dynamics look like. Along the way, there will be some function spaces and some analysis, and I'm going to suppress a lot of the details, but I do want to convey some of that. I want to tell you then a little bit about um, pioneering work that emerged, I think, from Katzenov and Weissler, and then expanded with the introduction of a bunch of harmonic anal analysts into this subject. And I'll name check a few people that are very important to me in this regard. So Kenig Ponce and Vega and uh, Jean Bourgain pioneered new harmonic analytic approaches to understand short time well posedness with very, very refined understanding of the initial data. And then the last thing I'll hint at is where the subject kind of sits right now. And uh, that's where I talk a little bit about maximal end time theory. So before I jump into it, let me make the main question of the subject. Here's a PDE. It has time in it. It's supposed to predict something that happens in the future. So the main question is what happens? <laughs> you want to understand the predictive power of the equation. However, sometimes someone else has begun to say that. And so the equation and its study can become very Baroque. And you talk about Besov versus Sobolev, and you talk about this, and you talk about that. And it can become very, very esoteric. But all of these subjects, all of these studies, in my view, should be filtered by that question. What can you predict about the future based on these equations? The fact that equations can be clairvoyant, I think, has impressed us all. And these equations sometimes predict the future. OK, um, that's a high standard that I don't always achieve but I aspire to say things about that are answers to what happens. So let's just set the problem up. So I'm considering here the initial value problem for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. This is a generalization that arises from these sources that I described before, but it's very closely related to the Schrodinger equation from quantum mechanics. And let me show you some of the features of this equation. So we have one time derivative and then the spatial Laplacian. I'm considering it here on a domain that I'll call omega, and I'll tell you about omega in a moment. Forget anything about boundary conditions. There's a change in sign, plus or minus. And that right-hand side term involves the wave interacting with itself as though it's a potential. So the wave is interacting with itself. And there's kind of two parameters in this family. The first is, what's the spatial domain? And the second is, what's the pth power? What's the strength of the nonlinearity? So I've coalesced this large subject into this two-parameter family, parameterized by the domain where I study things and the strength of the nonlinearity expressing the interaction. There's also this choice of plus and minus, and I'm going to phrase everything in my talk in the context of this initial value problem. So what these studies explore, in some sense, are uh, the interplay between two phenomena. So there's a phenomena called dispersion, which says that if you take a wave, let's say a square wave, a square wave is decomposed into some high frequency waves and some low frequency waves using Fourier analysis. And the wave components of that square wave, when they move according to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, the different colors in the wave move at different speeds. So the blue light might move at a different speed than the red light. And so what was once a square wave tends to spread out. And this phenomena of dispersion is associated with decreases in the height of the amplitude of the wave and an expansion in the support of the wave. That's dispersion. Nonlinearity, depending upon its sign, 
might have a focusing effect. So when the wave is tall, it may have a tendency to want to become taller. And in this way, there's an interesting balance between the phenomena of nonlinearity that might cause more and more focusing, and that might run amok and cause a singularity to form, versus this other more uh, gentle phenomena of pulling the wave apart through dispersion. And throughout all of these studies, there's basically a, an, an interplay between these things. To understand the relationship between these, uh, there is, at least in the frame that I have set, a really nice calculation involving dilation invariance. So the very best people in this subject, uh, people like Terry Tao and Daniel Tataru and Carlos Koenig, breathe this in such a way that they can look at sort of every quantity and understand how that quantity depends upon the dilation properties that are intrinsic to the equation. And essentially every kind of back of envelope, could this possibly be true question, is first filtered by this really simple observation. But I want to stress how powerful this simple observation can be. So let me try to explain what I mean by it. So if I have a function that's happened to be a solution, how I built it, I don't care. But if I have that function, and I change the way that its spatial variable is measured by a parameter, and I change the way its time variable is measured, remember my equation had one time derivative for every Laplacian. So there's a natural way that there's a parabolic structure in the independent variables, and then I adjust the height of the wave depending on this parameter lambda. Then if you give me one solution, u, I can form a one parameter family of such solutions parameterized by this lambda. In some sense, what this is saying is the equation forbids you to do certain things, but the equation does not forbid you to cause the wave to become taller as long as you change the corresponding spatial and time scales. So in some sense, the fear, if you wanted to try to prove that things don't form singularities, is the possibility that maybe the equation allows you to move in this dilation direction, causing eventually, as, as lambda goes to extreme values, a kind of concentration. So this dilation invariance plays a very important role throughout the theory, and it allows you to filter among all possible function spaces you might be thinking about for studying. You want to find those that happen to not depend upon the parameter lambda. For reasons that I'll make sure, makes, uh, clear in a little bit, um, we are often interested in studying these problems in certain L2-based settings. So one thing you can do is take s derivatives of this function that depends upon lambda and calculate how that depends when you calculate L2 in space. See how everything depends upon lambda and you change variables and you follow your nose through this calculation and you find that the lambda dependent rescaling in this norm depends upon lambda and the unrescaled original function. And now if you choose the parameter s in such a way uh, that it kills off that exponent, then you have selected the Sobolev index S, which happens to be invariant with respect to this lambda dilation. And that Sobolev index is quite useful. And it's called the critical Sobolev index. And it's sort of the natural regularity that is intrinsically attached to this particular partial differential equation. Uh, maybe I got to blow this up. So I'll blow it up quickly. So, as we will soon see, in this problem, there are some conserved quantities. One is associated with the L2 norm, and it's often associated with the charge or the mass. And the other is the energy, which is associated with one derivative in, it, in L2. So as you consider this family, depending on what spatial dimension you're in and what the strength of the parameter is, there are four really interesting regularity regimes or um, labels for how powerful and spooky the equation might be. So the mass subcritical case, uh, there's, there's also maybe in between here the mass critical case where SC equals zero, and then the intermediate regime where the Sobolev criticality is between the energy and the L2 norm, the energy critical case, and then the sort of poorly understood regime that resembles the uh, famous question around, around, about the Navier-Stokes equation, the energy supercritical setting where very little is, in, is often known. Okay. Now I want to distinguish something about the spatial domain. So we have this phenomenon of dispersion where the wave tends to spread out. If I'm doing the dynamics here on an infinite measure space, then there's an infinity into which the waves can begin to move. So the wave can just keep spreading out and spreading out and spreading out. And in this way, the height of the wave might become smaller and smaller and smaller. So that phenomena of spreading out can take place if I've got the room to do so. Well, let's contrast that with the phenomena on a finite measure space, like the torus. So this high frequency wave might move out, but then it comes back around the torus. 
So although things might sort of spread because of the different speeds, there's no escaping the fact. The L infinity norm cannot shrink because the waves keep coming back and back and back. So one might expect from this perspective that the phenomena of dispersion may be very, very helpful and powerful in the infinite measure space setting of RD, but the phenomena of dispersion might be more subtle and cause frequent collisions between different waves as they scatter around on the torus. Let's also distinguish the differences between the two signs, the plus and minus sign, because the large data dynamics are completely different. Let me show you a quick uh, simulation of what happens when we look in the energy supercritical problem with the good nonlinearity. This is the nonlinearity that's supposed to con control and fight against possible explosions. So we're going to look at snapshots of the, this initial data. So let me describe the initial data. This is the real part of a complex function. And it's uh, radially symmetric, but I've configured um, an oscillation in the imaginary part that in the physical um, understanding of this wave, it's as though there's an initial velocity causing this bump to try to focus towards the origin. So I've set the initial velocity of the wave in some sense to try to lump up and become more and more compactly uh, supported closer and closer to the origin. I'm trying to provoke a singularity but on this problem, I'm in the energy supercritical regime. I have an extremely powerful, helpful nonlinearity. So let's just walk through. Uh, this is not going the way I hoped. Let me see there. There we go. OK, so it starts. And you can see the nonlinearity is stepping on holding down that, uh, the, the, central per, uh, the, the central node. And some other oscillations happen. And then the wave escapes to infinity. So there you see the nonlinearity just stopping any possible explosion. Nobody knows how to prove that in this case. Because we're in the energy supercritical regime, we do not have a helpful conserved quantity at the level of regularity needed. And here we don't understand much about what to do, but we have simulations that are at least a little bit encouraging. So that's just a, a, a quick picture of, of one part of the dynamics. So I think what I just described will also become a little more clear when I talk about conserved quantities. So no matter how this thing moves, if it starts, it take, the dynamics take place on a sphere in L2. This quantity is unchanging with respect to time. The initial L2 size is forever the same. There's also this quantity that is somewhat like an H1 half norm. If you imagine sharing this gradient between these two factors uniformly, it's kind of like there's a half a derivative on two factors. But it's not exactly a signed quantity. It's not a, a coercive quantity. But that quantity also is unchanged during the dynamics. This quantity is very interesting. It represents the energy of the wave, and it, it too does not change with respect to time. But let me highlight the plus minus. So if we had the plus, this first piece looks a lot like the parabola we were talking about before. It's this great big parabola over this continuous integral of all these various dimensions. And then there's this other term. In the case of plus, we have a manifestly positive quantity. So as the wave moves forward, since the energy is conserved, you would know forever the LP plus 1 norm is bounded, can't explode in LP plus 1 with the plus sign. And also this measure of how much wiggliness there is in the wave, the H1 norm, is also forever bounded. But let's contrast that with the minus case. In the minus case, we can imagine a scenario where this first quantity goes to infinity, and this second quantity also goes to infinity, but they do so with fixed difference. So we might have an LP plus 1 explosion while also having an H1 explosion with fixed difference. And that phenomena, uh, in certain cases in the regimes that I've described, does occur. So there's a big difference between the plus or minus signs that you can see quite explicitly here. So just a few remarks that I mentioned already. Uh, one of the interesting features is if you go back to, say, the Noether theorem earlier when Alejandro said uh, and, and a story, uh, you would like to be able to explain these things to your grandma. And the person I thought of was Emmy Noether. And trying to explain this theorem to Emmy Noether as my grandma. And I kind of feel like she would understand the whole talk. So uh, that's who I thought of. Um, so if you take that kind of perspective, you have here a conserved quantity that is explaining the spatial uh, exchanges that are it's somehow deeper than just the fact that an integral is conserved. So often these local conservation laws can be dug into and you can understand more about that. So I want to mention um, two important themes that are closely associated with my contributions to this subject without going into a lot of detail. The conserved quantities have played an important role 
in advancing the solution a small amount of time. And then if you've advanced the solution a small amount of time with that amount of time depending on say the H1 norm, then you could run the initial value problem again at this later part of time and advance it the same amount of time because the H1 norm is bounded from above. So in this way, the local theory, when you have a good energy, can sometimes be used to build a ladder of equal distant steps and advance the solution to global in time. Okay, it's very similar to the theory of ODEs. So in this way, the conserved quantity has played a very important role in globalizing local in time results. Okay, but do you need conservation? Maybe you could get away with something that's other than conservation. So conserved says that the conserved quantity uh, does not change, but there may be other methods. Maybe you knew this was monotone, or maybe you knew that the time derivative of it was small. And so these kinds of variations about the role of the conserved quantity in the classical theory have uh, played an important role in extending the theory from, say, the 80s and early 90s into, a more, uh, into the current state by recognizing the important role that conservation plays, but recognizing that it being conserved is not absolutely crucial. And you might be able to get away with things like almost conservation or uh, monotonicity. So with almost conservation, there's a sequence of advances, and here's some buzzwords that I'll just highlight, that have been developed and some interesting technology that have led to improvements in the global in time theory, making a variation on what I've just described about doing this iteration with various uh, improvements. Another variation on this conservation law is when you can perhaps prove that maybe this new quantity isn't necessarily conserved, but if it's monotone, you might be able to say interesting things. And there are two things that I want to highlight here. Um, that's a typo, so it shouldn't say virile. Uh, so let me fix that. So virial. So the virial identity is uh, a, a method that takes advantage of monotonicity that allows one to prove that some sort of a solution does form singularities in the case of a minus sign. And in the case of the plus sign, the, the good nonlinearity, there are so-called more of its type inequalities that provide interesting space-time controls that allow you to globalize the solution in new ways. And all of these are somehow emerging from monotonicity formula ideas. So let me just go really fast through this because I want to get to, I want to finish at the nine, right? About seven minutes? Okay, great. So the local well posedness theory is basically an imitation of the classical theory of Picard iterates uh, that you know probably well from the theory of ordinary differential equations, except the challenge is to find the right function space in which you do this type of iteration. And there has been a sequence of developments, often uh, with injections from ideas related to Fourier restriction phenomena, Strickart's estimates, the Kakea uh, estimates, things like this, the Kakea phenomena, that have led to some very interesting spaces. And uh, I'm going to be really fast here because this is down in the weeds. We study the linear problem. And the linear problem can be represented explicitly using Fourier transform. And with the explicit representation of Fourier transform, you can write the solution as a Fourier uh, multiplier representation. And notice here that the Fourier multiplier has modulus 1. And therefore, you observe that the L2 norm at later times for the linear problem is equal to the L2 norm initially because you're not changing anything and you can apply Plancherel. There's also this convolution or Fourier uh, or multiplier representation, convolution representation rather, in which you see that if U0 was in L1, you have spatial decay. This, the, L, the L1 norm would decay like 1 over T to the D over 2, and that's a manifestation of the dispersion. So the, uh, the, the L infinity norm of the left-hand side is controlled by the L1 norm of U0 with a prefactor 1 over T to the dimension over 2, so that's the dispersion. So those two things that I just mentioned um, capture two of the phenomena that quantitatively describe the dispersive phenomena that I hinted at before. And then taking these ideas and some other inputs from harmonic analysis, one can build certain estimates. A representative example is this Strickart's estimate. So let me contrast. These are pointwise in time statements. This is an L4T statement. So this is integrated in time, and it's saying something in space-time, the wave is kind of bounded in L4 if its initial data is bounded in L2. OK, and now I should probably just fly through this stuff and skip it because of time, and that's fine. OK, and I already told you about this H1 theory. OK, cool. So let me tell you about maximal in time theory. So what I've tried to convey so far is some really interesting ideas from harmonic analysis have been injected into ODE-like methods on function spaces that have led to 
a detailed understanding in sort of optimal regularity classes for initial data to understand these problems. So we understand the problems well on short time. Okay, what that says is a dynamical system exists, but it does not answer the question what happens. And that's my key, right? That's what I want to know. I want to know what happens. So there has been an explosion of answers to the question what happens, and I want to give you um, three zones of this development. So I'm just going to try to give you three sort of representative striking developments in this frame of variations on the domain and strengthening the nonlinearity. So the first one emerges from breakthrough work by Jean Borgan in 1999, building on similar theory in the context of the nonlinear wave equation, but this is in the NLS situation. So Bogdan introduced uh, what he called an induction on energy strategy that was, subs and his result was for the energy critical problem. So that's the problem right at the energy threshold. So this iterative process of building the solution doesn't quite work. It's right at the edge. In the radially symmetric, three-dimensional energy critical problem, Bourdain introduced this new machinery and proved not only does the solution exist globally in time, that was already in advance, but he proved that asymptotically the effect of the nonlinearity vanishes. So an asymptotic description of the unfolding of time is that the solution eventually looks like a linear solution, one that we have these explicit Fourier representations for. So he gave a complete answer to the question, what happens? Ultimately, it's boring. It just looks like what you thought it looked like. But he only did so in the radial case. Uh, and he tried hard to do the non-radial case. Um, with my collaborators, Mark Keel, Giliola Staffolani, Hideo Takaoka, and Terry Tao, we removed the radial symmetry assumption by building on Borgan's general approach, but the advances required substantial new technology. And this showed that Borgan's approach was robust and interesting and could extend to outside of the radial case. Our result was technical and quantitative. And after that, Koenig and Merle noticed that some of the quantitative things that we relied upon could be relaxed and, and accomplished with certain compactness methods softer tools. So this released the technology that Bourdain and we had developed to be potentially applicable to many other scenarios. And this has led to a flourishing of many, many results of this flavor. And I want to highlight, uh, in particular, the work of Benjamin Dodson. Um, I tried very hard to prove this theorem, but Ben got there. And he proved that the mass critical problem was also globally well posed and scattered, at least in the setting of this defocusing problem. In the focusing problem, we know that there are singularities. Which brings me to point two. For the focusing problem, with the bad nonlinearity, I've already mentioned there are monotone arguments that show that singularities do form. But that's, again, an unsatisfying result. A singularity forms. Then you ask the question, what does it look like? How bad is it? What does it do? Can you describe it? Can you explain how the wave concentrates? So beginning with really interesting work by Landman, Papa Nicolaou, Sue Lem, and Sue Lem, who applied numerical methods somewhat similar to the um, cartoon that I showed before, that led to an interesting <coughs> conjecture, at least in the L2 critical problem. Merle and Tsutsumi and some work with uh, my collaborators led to other descriptions. But in my view, the singular <laughs> result on singularity, the result that is absolutely stupendously impressive and blows my mind is the advance by Franck Moreau and Pierre Raphael, who characterized the phenomena, at least around the singularity, in a very, very detailed way. Um, and this involves corrections to what you might expect, involving things like the square root of log log, very, very subtle uh, things uh, in absolutely pioneering work. And that work by Merle and Raphael was extended by me and Pierre to go to lower regularity scenarios. But I also think that this broke through a kind of intellectual or philosophical barrier. And now people believe that they can really describe remarkable singularities. I think these two advances in the context of Hamiltonian PDE provide some people with new ideas or some thoughts about how to possibly approach really famous questions in the theory of fluids, but that involves parabolicity and it's not obvious, but there are interesting advances here. And let me end on one third statement. So Jean Bergan asked a question about the behavior of high Sobolev norms. 
So I know that the H1 norm, I'm, I'm now thinking of a problem where I know that things exist globally in time. It has, say, the good nonlinearity, and I know the H1 norm is bounded for all time. So Bogan asked the question, how does the H100 norm behave? If, you, if you're initially really nice, you have really beautiful data, how does the high Sobolev norm behave? What this question is really saying is, if your initial wave has really smooth oscillations, does that smoothness persist? Or does the wave somehow begin to change and start to oscillate on smaller and smaller scales? Because there is a nonlinearity there. And when we square the sine wave, we generate sine 2x. And when we square the sine 2x, we generate sine 4x. So there, is there some sort of a cascade that is causing a motion of mass from low wave numbers towards high wave numbers? So that was Bourdain's question. So the easy first result is you can show that these high Sobolev norms are bounded by exponential upper bounds. And Bourdain extended that and proved polynomial in time upper bounds. And that was a big advance. The question was, are there any solutions that actually grow? And with my collaborators, we managed to show a result that I think is really cool, but it also illustrates that we don't know much. So consider some number like H100. There exists, not a for every, there exists initial data with size 1 in H100. And you give me any number you'd like. 10 to the 9, 10 to the 20, give me a number. Then I'll produce a time and initial data of size 1 in the H100 norm. And at this time in the future that I construct, that solution in this norm, H100, will have size bigger than the number you gave me. This does not say that the solution actually explodes to infinity, but it says we can go above any finite threshold. And our construction of that involved an extremely long time interval. So later, Guardia and Colossian, using shadowing techniques and a better control on dynamical systems theory than we had, managed to prove that this explosion takes place in a polynomial-like way, which prompts the question that maybe Borgon's upper bounds, or at least that style, might be appropriate and consistent. However, we still don't know if the solution explodes polynomially to an arbitrarily high level and then flattens out or decays. We still don't know if it goes up beyond that. And there's really interesting inspirational result, I would say, uh, things that might forecast how this may ultimately develop by Zahir Hani, who's a former student of Terry Tao, who's now at Georgia Tech. Um, so I hope I gave you at least a sense of flavor of Hamiltonian PDE. And once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Let's think, James, again. <laughs>